welcome everybody to the first uh, seminar of our standing group for this new academic year. Uh, together with uh, Jonathan Zaitin, we organize this seminar um, every third Tuesday of the month this year. And each presentation will focus on ongoing research uh, in EU studies. So today we have the great pleasure uh, to have Christopher Vickerton. Uh, Christopher is professor of modern European politics and society at the University of Cambridge. And his work ranges across EU studies, uh, comparative politics, and contemporary history. And he's currently writing a book on Europe since uh, 89, which will be the topic of his presentation uh, today. His presentation will be discussed by Anton Yeager, who is currently a postdoctoral research fellow at the KU Leuven, so the Catholic University of Leuven. Um, so Chris has agreed you will have uh, about 40 minutes for your presentation. Then, Anton, you will have 10 minutes for your uh, remarks and suggestions, and then we will open up the floor to uh, questions and remarks from uh, the audience. Uh, so, Chris, the floor is yours. So, uh, as Natalie said, I'm going to be presenting on a topic called Europe's long 1989. Now, some of the people who I can see attending know some of my previous work, which has focused quite a lot on the European Union and EU institutions. Uh, this is a rather different project. It's a book project that probably should be framed more squarely within the um, within the discipline of contemporary European history. Uh, so hopefully it'll be of interest for, for, for people in that respect. Now, uh, I wanted to start off just uh, with a little story. I wanted to take you back to uh, a balmy, warm evening in July 1987. Uh, a man was quietly walking his dog, and as he uh, does this, he notices a long line of limousines that are parked outside of the large, imposing National Theatre in Prague, a big 19th century building on the banks of the Vltava River. Now, this man is quite curious, and he joins a small crowd that gather at the theatre's entrance. Moments later, as he makes his way to the front of the crowd with his dog, he notices that the policemen next to the limousines all stand to attention and the engines start. Clearly something is happening. Now some dignitaries leave the theater and the man's gaze falls on uh, an instantly recognizable couple. They are Mikhail Gorbachev, leader of the Soviet Union and his wife, Raisha. To the man's considerable irritation, this little crowd um, outside the Prague National Theater begins to cheer. And the man mutters to himself, he says, do you really think that this man will save us from Hussack? And Hussack was the hardline Czech communist leader who'd been in power since uh, since the, um, the uprising, the failed uprising in Prague in 1968. As he looks at Gorbachev, this man starts to think that maybe he feels a bit of sympathy for him. And he starts to imagine all the endless meetings that he must have to sit through. Uh, all the people that he has to meet and greet, this exhausting routine. Then all of a sudden, Gorbachev looks at this man straight in the eye. And much to his cons consternation, the man somehow waves back to him. Um, and Gorbachev uh, gives him a friendly smile. Then moments later, the couple have disappeared and the man heads home with his dog by his side, walking slowly, angry at himself for the politeness and deference towards the Soviet leader. Now, some of you may have guessed who this individual is. I can see Jonathan nodding his head. Um, now this man, Vaclav Havel, just a couple of years later, was standing on a balcony looking out onto a crowd of thousands and thousands of people in Wenceslas Square in Prague. And Havel was wearing an old jacket and a pretty old and a scruffy scarf. And he was reading out the names of the first non-communist government to be, to be appointed in Czechoslovakia since 1948. Very soon afterwards, a still uh, communist dominated legislature voted him in as the country's president. Uh, what I like about this story is that it captures what we might describe as the rocambolesque quality of, uh, of 1989, of the events of 1989. They were so quick so unexpected, almost absurd in the way that one regime fell after another so swiftly and so uh, completely. 
Now, exceptions exist, of course, and those of you who know this period well will know that if there was any sort of revolutionary change in Poland, it took place in 1980, 1981, much earlier, which was a really tumultuous time for the, uh, for the country uh, where the regime was shook by the power of the 10 million strong solidarity trade union. Uh, but in many other places uh, in the Soviet bloc, the time between the beginnings of protests and the fall of the regime was really remarkable for its brevity. Think about the German Democratic Republic, it's just a few months, the same in, uh, the same in Hungary, a couple of months in Czechoslovakia, in Romania, uh, everything seemed to change in just the space of one fateful week in December. Now, it may be because of the the seeming brevity of these events of 1989, that the year itself has been given a relatively limited, relatively cursory treatment by Europe's 20th century historians. What's been much more interesting for Europe's historians of the, uh, of the 20th century has been the tumultuous early decades, from the origins to the breakout of the First World War, to the democratic breakdowns and economic crises of the interwar period to the horrors of the Second World War. In contrast, the events around 1989 have been assimilated into a much broader narrative about the 20th century as a whole. The most common one uh, being this miraculous post-1945 political stabilization and economic growth experience. Now, if we take this, what we might call this out of ashes, approach to thinking about Europe's 20th century history, that Europe itself miraculously emerged out of the ashes of, of these three decades of uh, instability and violence, then 1989 sits rather as the icing on the cake. It represents the end point, the extension of liberal democratic and market values to those Central and Eastern European states that have been uh, trapped behind the Iron Curtain after the <clears throat> after the Soviet annexations um, uh, at the end of the Second World War. But the effect is that when we think about 1989, it tends to be studied through earlier decades. Now, we see this in some of the most significant works of this uh, uh, period. <clears throat> we see this in Tony Jutt's 19, uh, his post-war book, um, History of Europe since 1945. Mark Matzauer's excellent, uh, quite short work called Dark Continent. Uh, some more recent ones, <clears throat> certainly the most recent is Timothy Garton Ash's Homelands. Essentially, 1989 by for Garton Ash is read as just part of the rise and then recent fall of political liberalism in Europe. <clears throat> now, what's driving this uh, interest by historians who are writing here in the in the 90s and into the 2000s, which was really um, something of a golden era for writing on European, uh, on Europe's 20th century. They were particularly interested in engaging with themes around, uh, especially the Second World War, uh, which tended to be discussed in a bit more openness than the past, particularly the role, not just of elites, but also of people, of societies more broadly in the events around, um, around the Second World War. <clears throat> the historian Henri Rousseau in France, for example, uh, wrote about Vichy and has written about a number of other things. And they really focused on this openness, this ability to discuss this darker side of the continent's history. Now, I have to say, before I move on, I have to say that I definitely understand this tendency to read 1989 through the mid point of the 20th century. Um, right at the moment, I find myself reading <clears throat> uh, Vasily Grossman's Life and Fate, which is this enormously uh, uh, thick and dense uh, novel about the Battle of Stalingrad, which is one of the best books I think I've ever read. And what you get out of this novel is the sense of the sheer intensity of the historical experience. Just remarkable, the events that are being described and the kind of human experiences that he captures. <clears throat> To be honest, as I read the book, I, I begin to think that my own book on Europe since 1989 is really just a sort of a post, a, a sort of a footnote to, to history. The events appear much less dramatic than uh, things that happened earlier in the 20th century. So I really do understand the, the grip that the uh, first half of the 20th century has on Europe's historians. I absolutely understand that. 
However, I think uh, there's a lot more that we can say about the period around 1989. Um, and I think one of the reasons why it was given short treatment by historians is that for the people of the generation that we're looking at here, Tony Jutt, uh, Garten Ash, Mark Matsauer, Mat these people, 1989 was really just a very contemporary experience for, for most of them. Not really a historical experience, but uh, a contemporary one. Garten Ash, as some of you may know, was essentially present in all of the key moments in and around 1989, and he documented them as a half historian, half journalist, and pioneered a particular genre of historical writing, in fact. Tony Judd, if we look at his memoirs, um, he was on the ground, so to speak, in 1989 um, in Czechoslovakia. He'd learnt Czech in the early 1990s, which he described as a solution to his midlife crisis. A very cerebral solution to midlife crisis. Uh, some of us have less noble solutions, um, but he was there and it really shaped his uh, his life. Um, it's quite difficult to frame, I think, 1989 as anything other than this final act of Europe's post-war revival, when the professional and the personal trajectories of the historians themselves also make also almost make it impossible to think of it as anything else. There is a slightly um, more um, uh, um, a slightly different take, if you want, which is the one taken by another historian, Richard Vinan, where he notices that a lot of these historians themselves were massive beneficiaries, personally and professionally, from the post-war boom. Um, they experienced this in terms of easy access to jobs. They experienced this as historians in terms of significant and systematic increases in academic salaries between the late 50s uh, and the early 1970s. So all of this might help us understand why we tend to think of the post-1945 post period as this golden age, with 1989 as uh, the icing on the cake. Now, let me say that <clears throat> in recent years, things have begun to change a bit in the, um, uh, in the historiography around 1989. <clears throat> Historians have started to think much more systematically about how we should frame 1989 and what its relationship might be to earlier periods. The work of somebody like Martin Conway in Oxford um, and, uh, and as a, somebody else I mentioned, Henri Rousseau, uh, they <clears throat> have uh, written about 1989 as being a post-war year, which they study um, comparatively looking at 1918 and 1945 and studying it comparatively with 1989. So a much more thematically sophisticated approach. We have some other people, uh, Conway Connett, uh, so Martin again, Conway, uh, uh, Celia Connett, who's here in Cambridge, and uh, Kieran Patel, have been very critical of what they say is the backward-looking aspect of contemporary European history. <clears throat> and they've written a lot about the histories of the present um, and about the need to situate Europe since 1989 into a number of more different, more complex, more pluralistic narratives. It's also the case that quite a few historians based in <clears throat> based in Central and Eastern Europe have argued for much greater in interconnections between um, the histories of Western and Central and Eastern Europe uh, around 1989. Obviously, I welcome these calls to liberate the histories of Europe's present, to liberate it from the burden of this mid-century fascination uh, by historians, but <clears throat> The tendency, I think, around some of the writing at the moment has been really to focus on how we should study 1989 rather than the question about the juncture itself. So <clears throat> the main uh, question, if you like, that's animating this paper, the one which I try to ask, but probably don't try to answer, but probably don't answer uh, 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 particularly well, but I do try. Um, the question is, if 1989 is not to be thought as the final act in Europe's bloody 20th century, then the question is, what is it exactly? What does that leave us with? What should we make of it? Now, my feeling when we think back to 1989 and we look at the historical accounts of it and the ways of thinking about it, I think we very often aggregate together, bundle together, sort of throw together a number of distinctive developments. Um, uh, the relationship between them needing is something which I think needs to be much more clearly delineated. And these different developments that we tend to bundle together are the following. The end of the Cold War, <clears throat> the collapse of the Soviet bloc in Central and Eastern Europe, the disappearance of the Soviet Union, 
uh, the end of the post-war Bretton Woods international economic order, the collapse of what some historians have called the post-war consensus. These are all important to our understanding of 1989, but we shouldn't just bundle them together under this broad heading of 1989. <clears throat> Nor do I think should 1989 be completely subsumed under any one of these elements. So let me try and introduce to you uh, this notion that I've developed, which is what I call Europe's long 1989. This, I think, is a way of understanding 1989 as a very distinctive historical juncture, okay? uh, a juncture, the content of which is not reducible simply to the post-1945 forward march of political liberalism, nor is it reducible to the political and economic disorder of the 1970s. I also think this historical juncture is much more than just the introduction of multi-party elections across the Soviet bloc. So the message, I suppose, from this paper that I'm going to try and go into in more detail is that the long 1989 for Europe refers, refers to a period of very broad um, and quite profound political, socioeconomic and cultural change. <clears throat> In a parenthesis, I'd like to say there is a dimension which I would describe as geopolitical change. That's a subject for a different uh, chapter in the book, and I don't go into it here, but I have, I, I'm have i willing to answer some questions about it if you're interested. But I'm going to focus more on the political, socioeconomic and cultural dimensions in this paper. So as a historical moment, then, I would say that the long 1989 sits between, okay, between, on the one hand, the political and social mobilization of the late 1960s and 70s, which were explicitly directed at the post-war consensus, revolts against the post-war consensus. The long 1989 sits between that and the era of depoliticized individualism that then characterized the 1990s and 2000s. <clears throat> now, politically, I would say the collapse of the National Communist Party apparatuses in the East was both preceded and mirrored by the collapse of post-war political coalitions in Western Europe and the breakthrough for far-right radical uh, right parties. Also, the active dismantling of the post-war socio-economic order, one which was very profoundly national in character, is another important feature of the long 1989. Now, this is often associated with the rise of neoliberalism. If you think about um, uh, something that's being uh, 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 there's an anniversary of this at the moment, uh, the, the coup in Chile, 1973, uh, the arrival of power of Pinochet. Think about Thatcher in 79 in the UK, Reagan in the United States uh, in 81. Um, if we go to Europe, actually, Europe in the 1970s and the early 1980s was not dominated by the rise of neoliberalism. It was dominated by various attempts by national governments to preserve the statist <clears throat> post-war economic models. And that was on both sides of the Iron Curtain. In the West, this was the era of what people called at the time neo-corporatism. Neo applied most notably in the UK, where there was a weak corporatist tradition. But in other European countries, flagging corporatist structures were invested with new energies uh, in the hope of re uh, reversing uh, the falling growth rates and the problems of stagflation. But in the East, we had an attempt to, 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 to support the existing model as well. Petrodollars from... Uh, from OPEC were being recycled through Western financial institutions in the form of very extensive loans to regimes behind the Iron Curtain. There's only one real exception to this, which was Romania. Um, if anyone knows about uh, Ceausescu's approach, uh, the approach in Romania, Ceausescu was very keen to pay back all foreign loans, even if it meant uh, deeply impoverishing his own population and imposing upon them grinding privations, which he which he did. <clears throat> so in the case of, uh, of Europe, it was only after uh, these attempts to revive the post-war corporatist statist economic models had failed that the economy was really emancipated from the national state. So in terms of timing, I really associate that with the long 1989 and not the immediate outcome of the 1970s economic crisis. Just to try and uh, summarize this notion of the long 1989, I think both across Eastern and Western Europe, what characterizes the long 1989 is an experience of loss and an experience of defeat. 
If you think about the years that stretch from the mid-1980s through into the mid-1990s, <clears throat> this encompasses an era where governments across Europe, that includes the regime in Moscow, the mixed economy models in Scandinavia and the Low Countries, across Europe, governments abandoned what had been essentially a century-long attempt, both not just on the left, but also on the right, to impose upon society a more rational order. One that's in line with a set of collective goals that can be politically identified. Now, the belief in this new order had certainly retreated from the high points of ideological conviction in the 1920s uh, and then in the 1930s, but they were nevertheless a very prominent part of what had been the post-war uh, compromise in Western Europe and also in the communist regimes in Eastern Europe. What we had, I think, both East and Western Europe was the emergence of what we might think of as distinctive worlds. These worlds encompassed architectural styles, um, uh, design, radio and television, recognizable consumer goods. Uh, these worlds had been created and it was precisely these worlds that were lost in what I call the long 1989. Let me end this introduction just on a quote. <clears throat> it's a quote from uh, an East German born writer called Jenny Erpenbeck, uh, who I like very much and I would recommend her work to you. I have a quote here where she describes her experience of exploring with her son abandoned summer camps that were built by companies in East Germany, in the GDR, for their employees and for their families. And I think her words really articulate this loss of a, of a world. She writes, uh, we open the doors of these empty bungalows, they aren't even locked, and we look quietly at the carefully folded wool blankets at the foot of each bunk bed, at the curtains that someone dutifully closed before departing long, long ago. All of those things that have remained unchanged, as if under a spell, since the last socialist vacationers spent their annual vacation here right before their companies were liquidated in the early 90s, and an absence that was only supposed to last two days became an absence that lasted forever. That experience, I think, of loss is in many ways most acute in the case of the GDR. But I think more broadly, there is something about the loss of collective identities, which is an important theme that holds together this notion of the long 1989, along with the transformation in political and socioeconomic orders that I described a moment ago. So what does the long 1989 help us understand, I think? And the first thing <clears throat> is just, um, I think it helps us go beyond the year 1989 itself. Um, and obviously, if you think about the term, the long 1989, there is a tension here. There is a tension between some sort of gesture towards a longer period, but then the focus on the single calendar year of 1989. Um, I'm aware of that tension. I think it's quite a creative tension. It makes me think of um, of the events of 1968. Um, some of you may know the work by Richard Biden, uh, which is itself called The Long 68. In a lot of uh, French works on 68, we see this rather ambivalent form, which is les années plural 68. So there's a kind of inbuilt sort of curious contradiction here, which is it's one year, but then it spreads out across a number of years. Often in English, we have a more um, a stricter formulation, which is just the 60s, okay, which points to a decade of change. So I think the long 1989, what I'm trying to do is to focus on 1989 as a kind of crucial moment, but at the same time to stretch time to before and after it to gesture towards this being a broader historical juncture. Another important goal, I think, with the long 1989, which is why it's possible to achieve it if we chronologically focus on this period from the mid 80s to the mid 90s, is that we can reach beyond the events of Central and Eastern Europe themselves, beyond the fall of the Berlin Wall, beyond the crowds that were massing in, um, uh, in, in Wenceslas Square in Prague to listen to Václav Havel. In a sense, what I'm trying to do is to relativize, not to diminish and, or to sort of um, uh, suggest is less important, but to relativize the role of Central and Eastern Europe in our understanding of 1989. It's not to downplay the role of these 89 uh, revolutions, but rather to stress that the historical juncture of, uh, of the long 1989 is not just a Central and Eastern European phenomenon. And I'll give an example of this later in the paper. 
to be honest, even if we look at uh, Central and Eastern Europe, it's the case that just focusing on 1989 is not particularly helpful in explaining um, the events themselves. If we take uh, a <clears throat> country like Romania, for example, uh, on the one hand, it seemed as if um, so much was concentrated in that final week of December, which uh, the days leading up to the um, uh, to the uh, to the shooting of Ceausescu and his wife. But historically, we have to go back to understand those events earlier into the 1980s. There were protests in Romania, at least from 1987 onwards. It's also the case that by the time Ceausescu was uh, 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 was uh, was dead. After that, very little uh, changed, in fact, and it took a number of years um, where you had figures who were elected in Romania in ways that often tended to demonstrate more con continuity than change. There's also some violence uh, taking place in Romania where minors were brought from other parts of the country to put down student uh, rebellions. This all takes place after the death of Ceausescu. So the political transition itself, even if we focus just on Central and Eastern Europe, takes us way beyond 1989. And there's at least a decade of, of change there. It's worth noting that in the case of Romania, it was in 1994 that Romania signed the Partnership for Peace Agreement, which was a preliminary step to joining NATO. And it was in 95 that the government formally requested admission to the European Union, which gives us a, something like a decade of, of change if we go back to the beginnings of the first protests in, in Romania. Now, another goal of uh, this notion of, <clears throat> uh, of the long 1989, I'm just going to run through some slides because I'm looking at the watch, uh, in other cases in Russia, if we think about the change in Russia, we know that the Soviet Union collapsed at the end of 1991. But a couple of years yet, uh, later, Yeltsin ordered the shelling of the Russian parliament as part of his conflict with parliamentarians and his attempt to push through uh, a privatization and marketiza a marketization program, which was very unpopular amongst the parliamentarians. So the idea that by the end of 1991, the, this uh, process of political um, and social transition has been completed uh, is certainly not the case, even for Central and Eastern Europe. <clears throat> now, another of the goal uh, uh, of formulating this notion of the long 1989 is to draw attention to what I describe as quite complex and overlapping processes of change. Distinctive temporalities uh, are at work. And I think focusing on the long 1989 helps us unpack some of this. Now, let me just Give you an example. <clears throat> uh, at the end of his book on, on Western Europe after the Second World War, Martin Conway discusses what he describes as the unmaking of democratic Europe. So his work focuses really on the period from 1945 to 1968. And he observes that by the 1970s, what he calls the democratic age was over. And for Conway, this created a sense of uh, what he calls a sense of democratic loss. And this sense of democratic loss became the, the foundation, the basis for the neo-populism and the anti-politics that we associate with the 1990s and the 2000s, and that we see in figures like Pim Fortone in the Netherlands or the late Silvio Berlusconi in Italy. However, <clears throat> if we think about what Conway is saying, I would suggest that there is actually a, an important historical gap between the anti-authoritarian utopianism of the late 1960s, so the end of his democratic age, and the emergence of anti-establishment populism of the 2000s. Between those two events, between the, <clears throat> the reactions against the post-war consensus of the late 1960s and the more recent um, uh, emergence of um, uh, anti-politics and populism, anti-establishment populism of the 2000s, there is a a historical period, and this is exactly what I'm trying to document with the notion of the long 1989. So one of the analytical aims then of the long 1989 is to try and create some sort of distance between these ideological convulsions of the post-war consensus and its discontents and the form of politics which prevailed from the mid 1990s onwards. And this latter form of politics, which was technocratic, rooted in a very broad consensus about the role of the market in allocating resources, also resting upon a mass withdrawal from uh, direct forms of political involvement, it really needs to be differentiated from the deeply uh, conflictual and politicized era of the late 60s and 70s. Uh, Mark Matzauer in his book, uh, um, dark continent, he observes at the very end of it, he's writing about Europe in the 1990s, and he says, 
Europeans accept democracy because they no longer believe in politics. It's for this reason that we find high levels of support for democracy, but also high rates of political apathy. And this, I think, is something that we have to contrast with the late 1960s, which was a time of enormous political and institutional creativity. From the rise of feminist and green movements to sit-ins, to art labs, to various forms of experimental theatre. So precisely, it's the long 1989 which has bequeathed to Europe this more barren landscape of political disenchantment that, um, that Mark Matzauer is describing. Sorry, a pigeon just crashed against my window, but it's flown off now. Okay. Um, and I wanted to give you some examples of <clears throat> examples of this, a sense in which if we go back to this earlier period to the 1960s, especially the late 60s and early 70s, what we have are the conflicts of the post-war era. What we have is a clash between the old and the new. And I think that generated lots of interesting conflicts and lots of political creativity. What we had in this, in this time was this conflict between the old post-war conservatism and new forms of radicalism. I was trying to think of various ways to illustrate, um, illustrate this, and there are a couple of examples, uh, one in Germany, one in Spain, that I think are quite useful. In the case of, the, of Germany, I was very struck by what happened to the Theodore Adorno. Um, uh, this story, as far as I can reconstruct, is entirely true. Anton might tell me if it's apocryphal, but it seems to me entirely true. Um, is that Adorno <clears throat> went back uh, to Germany and was in Frankfurt giving uh, the beginning of an important series of lectures in 1969. And this was in the midst of the student movement and the student revolts something which Ordono had a very ambivalent relationship to. He was much less supportive of the student movement than somebody like Herbert Marcuse had been. Um, these exposed quite important divisions within the Frankfurt School. Now, Ordono had been uh, castigated by students because he had sought the help of the police to get rid of students from a sit-in in, in his institute. And that was seen as a real sort of a stain on his, uh, on his character. So Ordono had been the subject of student protests. On the 22nd of April, um, Adorno began his introduction to dialectical thought, and he found himself the victim of uh, protests. Here we have female students who tried to undress Adorno and give him flowers. Okay? And what particularly struck me is that Adorno as a figure is really emblematic of the old order. Okay? A very radical thinker uh, intellectually, but he was coming to his lectures in a suit, very stuffy, very conservative, very unwilling to engage with the students and really didn't know what to do at all in this, uh, in this situation. He stopped his lectures, never went back to lecturing again. And a few months later, Ordona was dead. So there's a sense in which here in the late sixties, we have this real clash between the old and the new. This was also the case in somewhere like Spain. If we think about Spain in the late 60s, we have a profoundly Catholic society still under the late Franco era. Emerging in Spain as it opened itself up to Western tourism were some spots which were much more progressive than, um, uh, than the rest of the, the country. There was a particular uh, place on the coast in Spain known as Torre Molinos, which was a town on the Costa del Sol. And it became known in the course of the 1960s for an incredibly permissive attitude towards homosexuality. Now this coexisted for a time with the strong cultural conservatism of Franco's Spain. In 1971 the contradiction was too intense and a series of police operations uh, closed down this progressive side to Torre Molinos uh, and the place uh, lost its reputation as a gay haven and it was brought into the mainstream uh, of mass tourism. If we think about Spain in the early 1980s, we still have a sense of some tension here. The Movida movement, which was famous in Spain for the emergence of, uh, of figures such as Pedro Almodovar. If you think about some of those films, one example I have here, Entre Tinieblas, which was one of the earliest films by Almodovar, which was 1983. Here you have an interesting story where you have the contradictions are all situated within a convent at the heart of uh, a religious authority, a religious institution. And one of the messages from uh, Almodovar's film is that Spain is still very much in the grip of these old collective institutions, namely the church. But within these institutions, there is a huge amount going on. Lots of tensions, lots of contradictions, 
Our model of as reading is that the church has the capacity to be a much more progressive institution than people may think, but we have a clear sense of, of tension here. I think all of these examples point to this complex temporality that really is constitutive of Europe's long 1989. So on the one hand, some of these changes that uh, I'm describing have been a long time in the making. Uh, if you think about Europe's post-war era, the economic growth, the experience of secularization, the expansion in educational opportunities, all of these things had a transformative impact on European politics and society. But at the same time, from the mid-1980s through to the mid-1990s, very dramatic changes did take place. It was a concentrated uh, uh, period of change. A process of fragmentation, which was already underway, was accelerated uh, quite considerably. This was an important period, particularly economically, where we see the abandonment of the post-war national, uh, post national uh, Keynesianism and the adoption of a new economic model. <clears throat> A lot of this was made possible by this very famous uh, or I say significant summit of 1984, um, which was the one where uh, Thatcher and Mitterrand were able to achieve an agreement on the British rebate. And that unlocked the basis for what then was known, what became the single market um, agenda. And this provided a context and also a sense of external compulsion for dismantling the post-war national economic model. Now, let me just give you an example of how the long 1989 can help us understand better certain significant events. And I want to turn for this purpose to, uh, to Italy. Now, if we think about um, Italy in the early 1990s, the events that shook Italy between 1992 and 1994 have very often been compared to the regime collapse, which was uh, experienced across Central and Eastern Europe. In the 1994 Italian elections, essentially all of the political elite of the First Republic had disappeared. This 1994 election had, uh, according to records, was the one with the highest level of electoral volatility in any election in Western Europe since 1885. Very dramatic election where all the old figures in politics had simply gone and new people emerged. There was a real vacuum that was created. However, what I think is important to understand is that the crisis of Italy's First Republic did not start, as it usually is thought of as starting, it did not start uh, at the beginning of 1992 when this mid-ranking socialist party functionary, uh, Mario Chiesa, when he was arrested in Milan for taking bribes. And it didn't start when this person started to speak openly to the examining magistrates and to tell him about all the widespread corruption that existed within the uh, within the Socialist Party machine. The crisis of Italy's First Republic is really a crisis that I think is um, captured by this notion of the long 1989, because it happened much earlier. It happened uh, back in 1985. <clears throat> Here we have the dominant political figures of the era. Craxi in the middle, leader of the Italian Socialist Party, who was uh, brought down in a dramatic way with the corruption scandals, Andreotti on the right, who was an omnipresent figure of post-war Italian politics. But it started earlier, 1985, with the referendum in that year on the Scala Mobile, which was a wage indexation system. Now, this system was very important. It dated from uh, after the Second World War, and it essentially provided for Italian workers probably the most extensive protection of wages uh, of any country in Western Europe. Now for Craxi in the middle, uh, reforming, um, uh, cutting essentially the Scala Mobile became the focus of his economic program. It was seen as a way of kickstarting the Italian economy. But it was also very symbolic because it represented a real departure from Italy's post-war political and economic model, a departure from which there would be no return. And what was significant is that Craxi pushed through his reform of the Scala Mobile through governmental decree. Now, he used this method of decree, and this broke with the tradition, <coughs> which had been a long-standing tradition, of cooperating with the Italian Communist Party and making decisions of this kind. Here we have Craxi <coughs> in discussion with the Italian Communist Party, Berlinger, and the cooperation between uh, uh, government and the Italian Communist Party was a key part of Italian economic governance. Uh, 
Now, Craxi's move to get rid of the Scala Mobile uh, represented a break with that, and the Communist Party worked very hard to get a referendum on the Scala Mobile in response in order to try and stop the socialist government in its tracks. Now, this referendum on the Scala Mobile was significant for at least two reasons. One, as I said, is that it symbolised this end in this particular mode of post-war economic governance. It was also significant because the Italian labour movement found itself, as a result, pretty divided about where it stood on the Scala Mobile. And there was no unity on the part of organised labour in Italy to support the um, uh, to support the PCI, the Italian Communist Party, into position on the referendum. There were divisions within the labour movement. Craxi won the referendum in the end. He won it fairly uh, strongly. 54.3% uh, of Italians voted against repealing the decree and 46.7% in favour. There was a turnout of 78%, so it was quite a high turnout. The result, I think, is that the process of economic modernization was then pushed through. But one of the crucial things is also this began, I think, the moment where the Italian parties found themselves much less tied into Italian society, much more distant from their social base. And that then hastened, I think, um, the collapse of the Italian party system, of the First Republic party system, which then happened uh, in the period between 1992 and 1994. So I think it's at least quite a good example of how a particular crisis that takes place in just an early period in the early 1990s actually extends itself back to at least the mid-1980s and runs through for this decade-long process of uh, process of change. <clears throat> and let me just focus on um, uh, the cultural dimension, and then I will wrap up. So I realise now that I'm sort of hitting the 40 minutes. And to be honest, I'm afraid, Natalie, there's quite a long way to go. So I'm going to do a bit of chopping and cutting and snipping. Okay. Um, I just wanted to go through the cultural dimension, which is that I think something that significant has happened has been the changing role of big collective institutions. Um, we can certainly talk about the role of organized labor and trade unions, but also I think the role of the church is very significant. Um, and I wanted to give the example of Ireland, which experienced a very dramatic process of uh, of change in terms of the church's uh, authority in a relatively condensed period of time, which is this period from the mid 1980s through into the early 1990s. <clears throat> now Ireland, as you probably know, still is a, uh, a very strongly Catholic country, but back in the late 1970s, it was incredibly, um, uh, a, lot of, a very very strong position for the church. The Pope, uh, John Paul II, made a visit uh, to Ireland um, in 1979, which was a very successful visit with huge open air masses. But from the mid 80s through into the early 90s, Ireland experienced a series of scandals to do with the church. Um, one of them was this man, Eamon Kesey, who was a very prominent, uh, Casey, sorry, who was a very prominent Irish bishop. Uh, and a lot of things were discovered about him, uh, which brought him down. And he'd been a very popular, a very popular figure. There was a number of other scandals in the early 1990s that weakened the authority of the of the church. Now, according to historians of uh, of this period in Ireland, uh, one quote from Christel Hook has written about this period in a book on uh, on the politics of sexual morality in Ireland. She says that Irish society changed more in the last two decades, in the 80s and 90s, than it had had in the whole previous century. And crucial for this was the crisis experienced by the, the Catholic Church um, and the way it was embroiled in a number of controversial issues. And I think that particular crisis for Irish Catholicism ushered in this much more... Um, this much more individualistic uh, society that we associate then with the 1990s and into the 2000s, which is uh, more familiar to, to us. So let me just try and uh, conclude now. I'm just going to try and wrap it up quickly so that Anton can come in. I suppose the legacy I think I would suggest for uh, the long 1989 is that it ushered in quite a complex leg legacy, particularly around our understanding of uh, freedom in Europe. There was a sense, I think, in which the process of modernization, which is a term that appears a lot at the time, the process of modernization associated with the long 1989, in a way liberated Europe from the old order. We see this most prominently in Central and Eastern Europe, but we also see it in Western Europe as well. 
and associated with that uh, being liberated from the old order is a certain sense of optimism and possibility. Right? If we think back to the elections in Britain in 1997 with the arrival of new Labour, there was a sense of openness and a sense of optimism at that time. And I think that comes from a feeling that something about the old order which had weighed on uh, post-war European society for so long, the release of it created a certain, a certain liberty. But at the same time, I think it's quite a complex legacy, not least because what it also ushered in was a long period of, um, uh, of disenchantment. So in a sense, the legacy of the long 1989 is a dual legacy. There's a combination of gain and of loss. Um, what was gained, I think, were all the freedoms that we associate with um, an economic model. We associate with the construction of the single market. But on the side of loss, I think there was a loss in an understanding of freedom as a form of collective emancipation. A sort of freedom that's asserted over nature and over the constraints imposed by society upon itself. And that sense of disenchantment, I think, is something that really works its way out into, um, into the rest of the uh, of the of the of the era of the post of the, the era after the long 1989. Let me just end on a quote from uh, uh, Jenny Erpenbeck again. As I mentioned before, she was um, 22 when the wall came down. She grew up in Eastern Europe, but has become a sort of a, a well-known uh, um, writer in German. It's a quote, I think, which illustrates this complex uh, relationship to freedom. She says, <clears throat> she's writing now at the time when the war came down, there was suddenly a lot of talk about freedom, but I couldn't make much of this word freedom, which floated freely in all sorts of sentences. Freedom to travel, but will we be able to afford it? Freedom of opinion, but what if no one cares about my opinion? Freedom to shop, but what happens when we're finished shopping? Freedom wasn't given freely, it came at a price, and that price was my entire life up to that point. So that, I think, is the complex dual legacy, if you like, of the long 1989, at least in terms of our understanding of, um, of freedom. Okay, thanks very much. Sorry for going over time, Natalie. That's fine. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, so, Anton, you have now the floor for about 10 minutes. Thank you so much. Um, I think it's rather unnecessary to say that I don't need that much convincing about the project that Chris is proposing here. So what I'm going to be saying is mainly uh, commentary as assistance, trying to further the project um, a bit more rather than pushing back um, against it. Um, so this is a very vexing historical problem. Um, I think it's a real historical problem, as you said, you tried to give an answer to it, which is already quite convincing. Um, so how we conceptualize something like 1989 as a discontinuity seems very clear. Um, it's a clear instance of discontinuity if you compare it to other years, insofar as it's clear that something ended and something new began. Um, the question is not what persisted. So that makes the problem less intractable. At the same time, there's a deep ambiguity of um, what you describe is that specific balance between gain and loss. Uh, so what we need is Freudians would call a non-neurotic view of 1989, insofar as a neurotic view uh, would be intolerant of ambiguity and the inability to both see gain and loss at the same time. So what does it mean to have a acceptably ambiguous view of the year 1989 is both ushering a period of emancipation as having emancipatory content, while at the same time bringing to an end certain very cherished and very dear projects to a lot of people who are involved in it. If we go back to the original framing you proposed, the long 1989, if I remember correctly, is mainly also an implicit reference to Hobsbawm's own framing of 1789, so the revolutions uh, 200 years ago as a very long process. It's where it's even 1789, but also the aftermath doesn't just concentrate itself to that year, um, but actually stretches itself out around the decades uh, before it goes after. Um, and of course, that comparison, I think, is quite fair because there were many voices at the time, and I think you can see, you may see this in the German debate, also in Eastern Europe, which, who did make comparisons between 1789 and 1989. 
Um, and some Marxists called it a second capitalist revolution or a sort of second bourgeois revolution, which again is not hyperbole, but has real analytical content insofar as it did usher in the beginning of a fully global market economy um, or a market society uh, in a way that I think is comparable to 1789. So if you see 1789 as the first bourgeois revolution, the beginning of the first modernity, 1989 deserves its name as a circle. Second bourgeois revolution, also in terms of the property that was privatized, for example, and uh, the beginning of a second modernity, as Ulrich Beck once called. And it's a purer, more puzzling form of modernity, which I think is in many ways as revolutionary as uh, 1789, as Hobbes argued. There is a point at which that parallel breaks down, however, is that the original 1789, certainly in Hobbes' telling, um, was partly about loss. So I'm going to be reading uh, something about his Age of Revolutions, where I think he shows that even there, there was already a question of ambiguity. Uh, so he talks about the introduction of new property laws, mainly in the countryside in the 1790s and then during the Napoleonic period. So he says, and I quote him here, altogether the introduction of liberalism on the land was like some sort of silent bombardment. which shattered the social structure the peasant had always inhabited and left nothing in its place but the rich, a solitude called freedom. So this is from Age of Revolutions, and it gives, I think, a clear sense of how that original 1789 already had that ambiguity, it had a sense of loss. At the same time, the parallel does break down if you look at the original 1789 as a very agential process. There was a class that made a bid for power, that tried to usher in a new world, and there was a massive wave of politicization, or you could say the birth of all the modern ideologies we tend to associate with the 19th and the 20th century in the aftermath of the original 1789. And so it's a moment of emancipation that has a clear identifiable agent and has a real political legacy. And that is absolutely not the case for 1989. It's less agential. You don't have the feeling as if social change is effective, but rather that it just happens. It overcomes people. And at the same time, the legacy both East and West is not one of the birth of new ideological movements, but really of their protected and secular crisis. So it doesn't politicize or repoliticize society, but it ushers in a profound period of depoliticization. So even if Hobbesam is able to talk about a solitude called freedom, which the peasant experiences in the early 19th century, that solitude called freedom is now something that's generalized across society after. So that is, I think, a very important difference. Then there's a second quotation, I think, about someone who notices it quite early um, about what the emancipatory content or the difference with 1989 was, is Jean Baudrillard in the late 1990s is interviewed by someone um, and he talks about uh, the fact that what was specific about 1989 is an emancipatory moment. And he says, I'm going to be quoting him here, the communist system and the Berlin Wall didn't fall outwards as a mark of openness and freedom, but they fell inwards as a mark of disintegration and of a dismantling that was violent, but had no liberatory consequences. They self-destructed, leaving behind an empty space as when buildings implode. I think this gets us closer to the challenge uh, which uh, we're trying to solve, that if we stick to the original parallel to 1789, we have to cope with the fact that this was not an outward explosion, but it was very much an implosion in that sense. And I think you start the chapter by citing Goran Terborn, who also says this, the figure of change was implosion. Well, the figure of change in the original 1789 Hobbesian talks about is explosion in many ways. It's, it's literally a revolution that starts in Paris and then radiates out to France and then with Napoleon reaches the entire continent. Which is not at all the case for our 1989. So that is one suggestion in which I think we can get closer to the specificity of 1989 as a moment, as a second bourgeois revolution that still differs significantly from the original one. Um, but I wanted to ask one further question to Chris about the universal framing of 1989. It's not just an Eastern, but also a Western event. But that is immensely suggestive, and I think it's something I'm trying to grapple with myself, namely, it's not just about the end of a regime in the East, but it's also about the end of a regime in the West. And this is a far more difficult argument to make insofar as um, there was a certain sense that the East was kidnapped 
as Milan Kundera put it, in 1945, and then it was suddenly released from captivity in 1989. Um, but what you say is like, well, uh, something came to an end also in the West in 1989, which was very comparable to what was originally built in 1917 and 1945 in the East. Uh, and that is my question. So what was built in the West in 1917 that came to an end in 1989 then? Because this is, for example, the Italian question. If you see Thatcherism as an English perestroika, as some people have done, what then was uh, English communism? Or what was the English 1917? Because if you need something like perestroika, this means you immediately also need something like 1970. And that's my question to Chris, and I think there's one tentative answer that's been given to it is Charles Mayer's last book, Project State and Its Rivals, um, who talks about not just the rise of a project state uh, under Bolshevism in Russia, but the birth of a project state in the First World War all across Europe and the United States. So project states, classically post-liberal states, which took a very active interest, not just in society, the population, but also in the economy. And he sees 1989 really as the last death rattle or the euthanasia of that original project state. That gives you a universal frame in which you can say what ends in the East in 1989 and beginning 1917 also has its counterpart in the West. Of course, there are many problems with this frame of the project state. And I wanted to hear Chris a bit more about what was born originally or what was the lifespan of that creature that died in 1989 specifically in the West. Because um, some might say it's just the post-war yeah, compromise as it was built, but it does seem that something came to an end that didn't just start in 1945. Uh, there's a chronology that goes further back in that, as you say, an entire collective notion of freedom disappears. And I wouldn't say that that collective notion of freedom was born in 1945. That seems too lopsided, a cutoff. Um, but I'll leave it at that. And those are my suggestions to further this uh, incredibly promising. Project. It's, it's extremely interesting. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you so much, Anton. Uh, Chris, if you want to react quickly, and then we'll uh, ask the audience whether they have any questions for you. Sure. Um, okay, thanks very much, Anton. Um, I think, uh, I mean, these are things that I can reflect on and think about more at length and sort of slightly more deeply, I think, because um, a lot of them are very. Um, sort of uh, uh, good things for me to sort of try and unravel and think about. Um, I don't really have a sort of uh, any kind of quick, particularly quick answers. Um, I mean, what's interesting, what you say about 1789, I mean, um, historians to some extent, but certainly in France, uh, uh, the sort of the bicentenary of the French Revolution was really um, almost coincidentally sort of... Um, intersecting with events in Central and Eastern Europe, but entirely preoccupied with thinking about the French Revolution. Um, and uh, then people sort of subsequently sort of thought a bit about the, the comparison. Um, I mean, I suppose going sort of far back, what you were saying was interesting, but what you were suggesting, I think, is that there is some sort of quite fundamental ambivalence about liberalism itself. Um, and I think I, you know, I agree with that. Um, whether that can help us understand historically the events around the kind of that sort of decade of change that I'm describing, I think it can and it can't. So it can in the sense that what you have, especially in the early 1990s, you have these echoes of a sense of, um, is this it? Um, and that quote that I gave you from Jenny Erpenbeck, I thought it was really telling where she says, um, she says, you know, the freedom to shop, question mark, but what happens when we're finished shopping, question mark? And it's true that on the one hand, you have this incredible sort of an incredibly important attachment to freedom defined in a material sense, at the same time as you have an awareness of the limitations of that, because it doesn't take you so far, because there is a point where once it's satiated, what other sort of understanding of freedom may you have? Um, now, that's a problem that I think liberalism has struggled with a lot. Um, there's a kind of sort of emptiness to it, which I think has been a long sort of trans-historical phenomenon. So, and it, But it rears its head, I think, definitely in this long 1989. Um, at the same time, I think um, if there is a connection, I mean, the one about the first and second capitalist revolution, I think is quite um, 
uh, is quite compelling. I think it's broader than just being the extension of the market to um, Central and Eastern Europe. I think it's actually a continental development. Um, so in that sense, I think it's quite useful. Um, uh, I'll have to ask you about the Baudrillard sort of interview. I'll get that off you. Um, I think implosion is the dominant dynamic. Um, so I agree with you there. The final thing about project states. So <clears throat> I'm a little bit undecided, to be honest. I think there is a kind of longer lineage which takes you before the end of the second world war. That's true. But I think the second, the end of the second world war is really decisive um, precisely for the reasons that actually Charles Mayer has said. So I, I don't know about the newest book that you were referring to. So I'll have to look at the project states book. But if you go on his earlier historical writing where he talks about the difference between the two post-war eras and he compares the uh, the outcome after the First World War with the outcome after the Second World War, he makes quite a strong argument about stabilization after the Second World War, precisely through a very elaborate form of class compromise, um, which he eventually kind of describes as this form of corporate pluralism, which is just a, a fairly complex, thick set of institutions and structures that bind society to the state. That's quite a big sort of business. Um, and I think for me, if there is this implosion, certainly in Western Europe in the long 1989, my inclination is that there is a more abstract um, abandonment of what I was saying, this idea of imposing on society some sort of rational order that's independent from just these given, whether it's nature or the market or these kind of given set of coordinates. But what really I think comes apart is the post-war corporate pluralism. That for me is the sort of um, the more dominant sort of element. So, um, and that is, it's not to underestimate how significant that was. In the example I was talking about with Italy, I was trying to explain how it was a whole way of governing that disappeared, not just an economic model, but also the relations between different classes and different political um, actors. And the significance of that referendum in Italy in the mid 80s was that Craxi attempted to sweep it away and in many ways was successful. But a few years later, it brought the whole system completely tumbling down. But thanks for the comments, Anton. That's really, really valuable. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> Now you have all the opportunity to ask questions or make uh, comments to Chris' uh, presentation. I will just ask you to raise your hand on, on Zoom and then when it's your turn to turn on your camera and uh, ask the question. I uh, saw uh, Jonathan and then Piotr. Uh, yes, thank you, Natalie. And, and thanks, Chris. I would say, even though this is a very different project from the other things of yours uh, I have read, um, it has some things in common. Uh, it's very bold, it's very ambitious, uh, it's iconoclastic and even uh, contrarian. But I would actually like to push back a bit. Um, uh, and I, I should say two things. One is that I, I was originally trained as a historian, my PhD is in, in history. And so I would say something about how historians make arguments, which is, in some ways very different from how social scientists make arguments. And uh, in 1979, 1980, I spent time in uh, East Central Europe uh, about the same time that uh, Tim Garton Ash was first getting involved with the opposition uh, movements there. And so I got to know some of the same uh, players and although I didn't work on them, on the, these issues professionally, I continued to, uh, to follow them. So first, a comment about how historians make uh, make arguments. So what's very striking, and it, it, you know, it was very present in how uh, you built your your argument. Uh, historians build their arguments characteristically by reacting to previous historians. So they say uh, there's a historiography that says various things, and Typically, it's neglected something or it's overemphasized something, and then uh, you know the, the the new historian is going to redress that or draw a different uh, kind of uh, balance. And that is how historical monographs and articles are often written. But when you come to a big fresco type uh, narrative, and people, uh, I mean, you you spoke about. Um, Tony Judd and Mark Mazauer uh, and the discuss and talked about uh, Eric Hobsbawm, 
I mean, that kind of, what emphases do you make in a narrative? What do you bring into the light and what do you uh, consign to the, the shadows is a very uh, characteristic uh, way of, of arguing. And of course, it's hard to argue against because it's, it's really a matter of uh, how do you build a, a narrative and choices about what you emphasize and not. Okay, my, so the one thing that really struck me is that um, at least as you presented it here, and I, I imagine in the book it would be different, um, in talking about the, uh, the law of 1989, um, you're kind of pushing, in a sense, the experience of East Central Europe into the background. Because there, there's no question that for people writing about um, East Central Europe and the, the countries which were part of the, uh, the Soviet bloc and even Yugoslavia, which is outside of it, 1989 is seen as a great uh, caesura. And you, if you look you know, on Amazon, you can find plenty of books on East Central Europe since 1989. So it's not, and there, you know, the idea is the end of the Cold War, something which was really not expected, not, uh, predicted um, by most um, analysts, and then that had uh, its impact first and foremost on uh, on East Central Europe, and then it had some naturally um, collateral or reactive impacts back on uh, on Western Europe and on the West uh, more generally. But say for Western Europe, German reunification would be the most important, and then that has. Uh, various uh, consequences, also uh, for the rest of Western Europe and for uh, for the for the European uh, Union. So I think there's a real concern that um, by talk, making a, a study of the long 1989, one which is is as much about uh, Western Europe in a longer you know 10 or 15 year period, you, you will lose what's specific about uh, East Central Europe. And there also the sense of optimism uh, and, uh, and liberation. Um, I mean, comparisons were drawn by the discussants of 1789 by yourself, I think rightly to, the, to 1968, but another comparison would be to 1848, which is very much um, in the, uh, uh, you know, attracting historical attention uh, again, now there's a new big book by Christopher Clark about it. And you could see, um, whereas the revolutions of 1848 and 1849, um, you know, created enormous optimism, which was then uh, repressed. Um, what happens in East Central Europe is, in a way, uh, at least in the first instance, the revolutionaries triumphed. And the disappointment was a much uh, longer term process about uh, how the transition uh, took place, how different alternatives uh, were in the end marginalized and some of the negative consequences of that. Although uh, joining the EU, I think for many would have been seen returning to Europe as a, uh, as a, as a possible thing. I think it's also very striking that the main uh, voice you quoted, uh, you know, was an East German voice. And I think the experience of East Germany um, is a different one, a very distinctive one, and a more ambivalent one um, uh, in the way, some of the ways that Eric and Becker, uh, you know, uh, makes clear than that of the, the other uh, East European countries. Let me just make one uh, last set of points, which is that in talking about the, the long 1989 in terms of the decline of, uh, of neocorporatism, uh, in the West uh, and the rise of neoliberalism, uh, you know, you may be uh, putting too much together, mixing different kinds of uh, of chronologies um, uh, in a way that, that may be hard to sustain. I mean, for example, your Italian uh, e example about the the. Uh, the Craxi's referendum on the, uh, the Scala Mobile and say, okay, there was the post-war tradition of consulting and governing with the Italian Communist Party. Well, I mean, for most of the post-war period, arg arguably 
the Italian Communist Party was a pariah, which was excluded from uh, Italian politics. And it's only in the mid 1970s, and especially with the election of 1976 and the, uh, the discussions on the historic compromise that the Italian Communist Party has brought into the, uh, the story. So from 1976 um, to 1985 is a relatively short uh, period. And one could make uh, arguments about that uh, in some of the other uh, cases, the kind of cultural uh, revolutions, if you would be thinking of countries like Germany and um, the Netherlands would be much more post-68. Ireland would be the, uh, the odd country out that these were more uh, delayed into the 1980s and 90s. In any event, I think uh, historians will push back, as well as social scientists, uh, against um, the, the attempt to argue that this, the long 1980s are a kind of clear-cut uh, caesura there, even in the, the culture, politics, and political economy of the, uh, the West. Sorry to go on, uh, on so long, but um, since your discussion was so constructive, I thought I would be uh, you know, push you a bit more critically. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Uh, Chris, before you, you answer, um, and because uh, we still have uh, 15 minutes, so perhaps we can take another question and then you answer to both of them. So, Piotr, uh, you're next. Can you introduce yourself? Um, <clears throat> of course. Uh, my name is Piotr Marczynski, and I just started my PhD at Universite, Universite Libre de Bruxelles. I think that's the proper way to pronounce it, under the supervision of Natalie, and that's how I uh, uh, ended up here. Um, <clears throat> and also, originally, I'm uh, Polish, uh, so also like in, in this sense that drew my attention to the lecture today. Um, and what I wanted to ask about is this notion, a lot of that, a lot of ground when it comes to um, particular experience of Eastern Europe was already covered by uh, Jonathan. But I was really fascinated um, by the notion of um, this dual feeling or this like neurotic feeling of both hope and loss. Um, and something I would like to hear more about, uh, because I do think that in the Polish case, although there was... Tremendous amount of hope. Uh, now there's more and more uh, historiography emerging that uh, actually documents this feeling of loss. Um, and a lot of sites within Poland that have been neglected with the entire social tissue being broken down, which was not really noticed at the time. Um, and some of the loss, in my view, is uh, processing of the grief, so to say, is also happening today. Um, so yeah, I wanted to, wanted, wanted to ask us for you to elaborate. When it comes to this ratio, would you say that, um, like, how would you say the experience is different and maybe also time-wise to what extent processed and how between the regions? And thank you for the lecture. It was very interesting. Thank you. Then we have a, a last question that I can see from Yasa or Jessa. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks for the lecture. Um, oh, I'm presenting myself. I'm uh, doing a PhD in um, at Free University in Berlin. Um, and I have basically two questions because um, one was because you don't really, you haven't really mentioned it. And I think Jonathan did in his comments, but where does Yugoslavia fit in your story? Because um, engaging with it, I think you could, it could be a productive. Because it adds kind of another temporal line to your whole story of that goes against the simple story of 1989. Um, because on the one hand, in Yugoslavia, 1989 did not really mean much, and everything really started happening in 1991, um, which in your in the story that you criticize is usually already the time of resolution where the things were already kind of settled. And on the other hand, this kind of supposed end of politics, the technocratization. Um, the individualization of freedom of Western Europe was often articulated then in the 90s with this kind of barbarism and communitarianism of Yugoslavia as its kind of other, right? Um, and Yugoslavia was often portrayed after the collapse of communism as the ultimate illustration of then the, um, of why any collective claim is dangerous and why only individual and rights-based claims um, are kind of legitimate. 
Um, so yeah, where does Yugoslavia fit? And then the second question would be um, your kind of use of Central and Eastern Europe as a label or conceptualization for this kind of second half of Europe that you discuss um, and the way that you narrate this history or counter history of, or however you want to call it. Because I was wondering, because the label itself is a kind of product of the long 1989, right? Um, I mean, this resurfaced now when Kundera died, but um, the whole Central and East, Central Europe concept was very explicitly a kind of rewriting of geopolitical um, kind of imaginaries, where this anti-communist dissident um, launched or re revived this label as a way of distancing themselves from Russian communism and placing themselves in this Western capitalist democratic camp. And again, I think Yugoslavia here is kind of an interesting example because this label of the, or this kind of uncritical conceptualization or adoption of Central and Eastern Europe as a label um, kind of breaks it apart where now Slovenia and Croatia are kind of taken to be part of CEE um, because they are now members of the EU as well and because of the longer kind of Habsburg um, legacy. Um, while the rest of the former Yugoslavia falls under this Western Balkans label, which is kind of um, outside of these bigger histories. Um, and it's just a kind of made up EU um, yeah, label. So yeah, um, yeah. the second question basically is about the CE as a label. Um, and because here yeah, you kind of used it rather uncritically, but overall, I really enjoyed your labels, um, your lecture. So thanks very much. Thank you. So I don't see any other question for now. So please, the floor is back to you. Okay. Well, thanks to everybody. Thanks to Jonathan. Thanks to Piotr. Thanks to Yasha for uh, for your comments. Um, and this is a work in progress. So these are all really helpful things for me to to think about and to take on board. And it's things I've been thinking about. Um, to Jonathan, I don't have any sort of um, particularly sort of direct answer i think what you raised is the problem which i think you know is a big sort of part of historical writing which is about framing um <clears throat> and often a lot of the sort of discussion and competition or disagreement is around the way you frame certain um historical periods um another part of historical writing is a much more finely grained and detailed discussion that's usually quite empirical and it's not really about framing but it's trying to um discuss what we might think of as you know historical evidence um this is clearly an exercise in framing i think uh, what i'm doing um the the ambition i think of the long 1989 it was um it was twofold um and it was definitely not um there was no aim to somehow demote in the kind of hierarchy of importance to demote one part of europe and sort of um uh, promote another there wasn't a, a kind of sort of um competition going on in my mind um when i talked about relativizing the importance of central and eastern europe in 1989 i suppose what i was just trying to draw out was how it seemed to me uh and this is why the sort of the formulation is the long 1989 it just seemed to me more than however significant they are more than those events which take place in a remarkably concentrated period of time um, towards the end of 1989. Um, and, you know, significant though they are, and they've been treated quite exhaustively in quite a lot of historical writing as events unto themselves. Um, I do think it tends to dominate a little bit too much in the way that we think about 1989. Um, and I was struck by actually how in this broader process of change, there are a lot of things that are taking place both before and afterwards uh, that need to be included. So I suppose it was a, an effort at sort of inclusion rather than uh, losing the specificity of, of 1989, as you, as you put it. Uh, I'm not sure I'm saying anything particularly new about 1989 itself. Um, I've certainly not uncovered any particularly new take on any of the um, main events that we often associate with 1989. Um, there's been quite a lot of uh, work done on that, some uh, some slightly revisionist. I mean, probably the one sort of area where there's a live debate is really about the geopolitical dimension, I think. Um, the period 89, leading then into German reunification, the collapse of the Soviet Union, that period is clearly now becoming really important for historians to then think about whether they've got it right in terms of what happens afterwards or not. And there's been some historical writing about that that tries to focus on sources. Um, so that part is probably the most open part. The rest, I don't think I'm doing anything particularly new, but I do think this formulation of the law 1989 is quite helpful for us to go 
um, beyond just the confines of those events of the second half, or basically from September to the end of December 1989. Um, in terms of um, the... Uh, let me just talk about Yugoslavia first. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah, so I think it's extremely interesting. I think Yugoslavia plays quite a complex role, I think. Um, some of that role you actually described yourself. So some of the importance of Yugoslavia is about it being a sort of justification for what's going on in other parts of Europe. Um, I always remember the trip that uh, François Mitterrand made as president in France uh, very, very shortly before the vote on the Maastricht Treaty uh, in France. He made a trip to Sarajevo and he was wearing this kind of um, sort of uh, bulletproof vest and sort of saying, you know, if we don't vote in favour of the Maastricht Treaty, what's happening here is going to happen to us. Um, you know, for the meeting, I was more a sort of subtle historical parallel, but certainly for the purposes of propagandising before the Maastricht uh, Treaty referendum, Yugoslavia was had a, had a role, had a function there in, 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 what he, in his campaign. Um, and the result in France was really very close. And this is one of the reasons why he did this. So in that sense, there is this kind of use that was made of Yugoslavia. Uh, which is what you described. For the purposes of the long 1989, my understanding of what role Yugoslavia plays is slightly different, which is that I think it's another illustration of this broader sort of process of implosion and this loss of a world. Um, this notion of a sort of a distinctive set of worlds that were created, which in the course of a fairly brief period of time simply disappeared and became just these sort of historical artifacts. Um, Jonathan mentioned the GDR, which is maybe the most extreme kind, which is essentially the country sort of ceased to exist and it was absorbed by an expanded uh, um, federal republic and very quickly became treated as this kind of historical artifact, which meant that people who had been citizens of the GDR found it sometimes a bit difficult to digest. Um, in the case of, I think, uh, the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, I think it's something similar. There's a kind of a sense of loss there of that world. Um, uh, and so... And the, the war itself is, in a sense, the collapse of a particular federative model. Um, so in, it sort of, I think it's a, a much more violent and much more extreme version of this broader kind of process of, uh, of collapse. Um, it has also an important geopolitical role, I think, Yugoslavia, in terms of um, uh, uh, the role of the United States after the end of the Cold War in, in Europe in the early 19, 1990s. Um, you asked about labels. I'm not particularly um, sort of a great believer in labels in this case. If I'm using them, it's not to make any particular points. I don't think any of them are particularly good. Um, uh, even the sort of distinction between West and then Central and Eastern Europe is not particularly helpful in some ways. Uh, the category of Western Europe is much too broad. Um, the obvious kind of cases that sit uh, in a slightly uncomfortable place within this broader category of Western Europe would be uh, both Spain and Portugal, um, whose own temporality is much more associated with the end of their political regimes than it is with 1989 at all. Um, so I'm, if I'm using them, it's just shorthand because there's many countries involved and the shorthand can be sort of illustrative, but it's not meant to be particularly um, political or making any sort of deep statements. Um, uh, Pietro, what you were saying about this notion of loss, I'm very interested. I mean, it's very interesting that you were saying that there's a kind of reckoning with this loss, which at the time had been sort of sort of um, hidden or kind of sublimated through some sort of embrace of the kind of new freedoms. Um, I mean, that's my own feeling, and I think it's quite an important thing to investigate. I would like to know more about it. Um, I definitely don't think it's something that can be expressed in some sort of ratio. Like, I wouldn't be able to quantify it. Um, I think it's more just that um, at the time, I think um, the most obvious way of thinking about it was the... And this was, I think, the dominant sort of way of understanding it at the time was about the costs of transition. Um, and there was a slightly kind of technocratic sort of way of managing this, which was essentially, yes, there's some discontent. Yes, some people are a bit unhappy. It's a bit complicated, but that's because we're going through this process of economic transition. And these are the markers and this will all solve itself in time and et cetera, et cetera. So it was absorbed within the kind of broader paradigm of transition, um, which became a kind of subfield of you know, um, of political science for a while, this kind of notion of sort of transitology and transition. Um, I think that that missed something. Like, I think it was much more sort of real and complicated than that. It wasn't just a byproduct of some transitional economic um, 
uncertainty. I mean, the economic effects were very real, and you know, countries like Poland suddenly found themselves grappling with types of you know unemployment and dealing with foreign businesses in ways that were quite new, and all the kind of learning to deal with Western capitalism. All of that stuff was real, but I think there was this bigger story about what the position we think we're in and what we thought we were going to get and what we ended up getting. Um, and that, I think, is something that's not really being told or documented in a particularly systematic way. What we just have are sort of snippets of things and anecdotal things uh, rather than a proper narrative around that. Um, so I'm, uh, I don't have much more to say than just that I'm really interested in that attempt to develop this notion of a dual legacy outside of just this notion of transitology, which I think dominated uh, uh, people's way of thinking about it for a long time. Thank you very much, uh, Chris, and thank you very much, Anton, for the discussion. Thank you all uh, the people who um, listened and participated to uh, this first seminar. Chris, may we know when, more or less, the book will be out? Uh, not for a long time, Natalie, that's all I can say. Okay, well, good luck with uh, the, the research and uh, the writing. Um, and I invite you, if you're interested, to follow our activities. Every seminar will be uh, advertised on the website of the ECPR and of the Standing Group. And the next seminar will be the next month, the third Tuesday of the month. Have a good evening, everyone. And thank you again, um, Chris, for the, the very interesting Thank you.